हाँ ओके सर स्टार्ट स्टार्ट ना सो गुड इवनिंग टू वन एंड ऑल आई वेलकम यू ऑल इन दिस वेब टॉक सीरीज फ्रॉम माय बॉटम ऑफ हार्ट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई विश यू हैप्पी फ्रेंडशिप डे हाँ सेम टू यू थैंक यू सर ऑल ऑफ यू नो व्हाई वी आर हियर ऑन दिस ऑनलाइन प्लेटफॉर्म एवरीवन ऑफ अस आर क्वाइट अवेयर ऑफ दिस वेब टॉक सीरीज ऑफ अ ग्रेट एकेडमिशियन प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर मिलिंद पंडित सर आई बी प्राउड टू कंपेयर दिस प्रोग्राम एज वी नो द टॉपिक फॉर टुडे डिस्कशन इज डेवलपमेंट ऑफ पीएचडी थेसिस स्टेप बाय स्टेप डूइंग रिसर्च इज अ रियली चैलेंजिंग टास्क इट इज नॉट एवरीबॉडी इज कप ऑफ टी टू डू इट जेन्युइनली वन रिक्वायर्स टैलेंट क्रिटिकल थिंकिंग logic competence and many other characteristics unfortunately in our country research aptitude is not de- developed compared to european countries there are few academicians like dr milit pandit sir who devote their life to research and innovation most of the other people do research only to get degrees jobs and other benefits i think this may be one of the reasons why india has got the tag and developed country last year we have a wider vision of research we have a great alchemist as the last time dhani dar sir used by my friend dhani uh, dar sir mm. so we have a great alchemist in dr milit pandit sir he is playing the role of catalyst in completing our phd degree under his guidance i am sure many of us will do genuine research Pandit sir is an ideal person for all of us to guide us in the right direction. This series is the first step towards it. Uh, let me introduce you today's chief guest. Uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, he, he doesn't require introduction. Uh, he is well known academician in uh, Maharashtra and not only in Maharashtra but um, across the country. but still as the formality of this uh, program i am uh, introducing uh, today's chief guest his complete name is dr pandit milin bhagwan uh, he has completed ma in english set net in grf psb and uh, ct as well uh, he has completed graduation from milin college and in college uh, aurangabad and uh, pg onwards in department of english dr baba sahib ambedkar marathwada university aurangabad uh, his phd topic is mahishweta devi post colonial and subaltern aspects uh, his area of interest is linguistic theory literature and social studies his ambition is to be a teacher that would help the cause of revolutionizing the country on a on an academic and intellectual basis he uh, has uh, you know work uh, in various position now right now he is working as a full time associate professor at matsodari shikshan sanstad art science and commerce college ambed district jalna uh, he is also working as a recognized research supervisor the guide in the subject of english and of the under dr baba sahib ambedkar marathwada university aurangabad He worked as a research person in many places, uh, be central or state universities, for delivering lectures on the academic and social grounds. He has delivered numbers of keynote and valid dictionary addresses at state, national, and international level seminars, conferences, workshops, and refresher and short-term courses across India. He has published uh, two uh, one. is authored and the other book is edited uh, he has published 10 uh, plus research articles papers in the standard or reputed and uh, peer review international and national level journals and books uh, he is also an editor on epitome journals that is international journal of multidisciplinary research he is also uh, appear on Uh, he is also a uh, associate editor on national level journal uh, entitled innovative research 
currently he is a member board of studies in English, Dr. Babasar Ambedkar Marathwada University, Aurangabad, uh, from 2018. Uh, he is nominated as a member on board of studies in English by Dr. Babasar Ambedkar Marathwada University, Aurangabad. He headed some committees and uh, he was uh, he, he was a member on the College Development Committee, formerly called the LGC LMC of Mercedes Sixth Sons of Art, Science and Commerce College, Mumbai. Uh, because of his uh, hard work, uh, the college got a uh, a plus uh, net grade. Uh, because of uh, him, I think uh, you know. College got A plus. Uh, he sorry once again yeah, again and again because of technology actually we get this now again and again. As a member of BOS, he designed syllabus of communication government polytechnic. Uh, he was college con convener for National University Student Development Program run by Tata Institute of Social Sciences. That is. And JP Morgan Chase Foundation, London. Uh, he helped uh, around 400 plus students uh, for placement. Uh, he solely designed uh, syllabi of uh, communication skill and video courses, respectively, for uh, much of the science and commerce college. He worked as the chief uh, superintendent for university examination work. The chairman of the paper setting panel, Sir, uh, Dr. Babu University. Ha, sir. <laughs> I think that is enough. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, as uh, we have a great academician, and uh, fortunately, he is uh, with us, guiding us, and uh, not wasting much time in uh, between. You, uh, I, because uh, you know, everybody knows uh, uh, there is no need of introduction, and uh, that's the reason I hand over uh, the charge to Dr. Milind Pandit sir. I uh, request uh, Milind Pandit sir to start uh, his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, sir Zero. Uh, my request to the organizers has been instead of introducing me time and again let us uh, directly stick to the theme of the day uh, the rest of the things can be added to that but not my introduction this is my humble request to uh, you all and uh, one thing I would like to clear here is uh, my college is not accredited with A plus grade. It is just A. So that is the correction I would like to make here. And uh, I don't think I deserve uh, the adjectives like great, catalyst, etc. But then uh, I just uh, thank you, Sir Zero, for considering me worthy of uh, these adjectives although I am not but thank you very much and uh, I am also grateful to the organizers and the team has been working so hard on uh, arranging these lectures these web talks I am so happy for the kind of work they have undertaken and uh, Every time we have a new topic, at present we have been dealing with research and it has been uh, quite for a long, uh, I think for a month now and this is the fourth lecture, that uh, our fourth session that we have uh, gathered here, assembled here for and uh, I really appreciate uh, the curiosity, uh, the curiosity levels that uh, you have developed and uh, by way of uh, this interaction of ours, 
we are just uh, trying to clear the basic ideas uh, related to research. And as we understand, research is an area which is an unending process and uh, the area that would never never have a stop at all. Every time we find that there's something new and that becomes part of uh, say research. Anyway, uh, today's uh, session is uh, slightly or even uh, more different from what we did in the last three meetings. The reason is that today we are going to discuss uh, something that is uh, uh, somehow a kind of uh, semi-formal talk or we can say that it is uh, partly formal and partly and uh, we are going to discuss uh, today as to how to develop uh, the thesis step by step. I would uh, request uh, Mr. Balde, yes, sir, uh, Chawan, to allow me to share my. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Already, already. Okay. So, Balde has been doing great work looking after all these technical aspects and uh, we are happy for him and uh, we are satisfied that we have uh, uh, Baldev Chavan with us uh, overcoming each and every technical issue. Uh, Baldev, shall I stop it? Sorry, sorry, sir. Okay, I'll try another option. Oh, yeah. No. Yes. Okay, sure. Try now, sir. This one? Okay, present. Again, present. Stop your presentation. Stop. Repeat, huh? Yes. And now minimize your uh, Google Chrome. Does it appear? Just a minute, sir. No. Presentation. Okay. Shall I stop it and open again? Uh, yes, sir, again. Hmm. Present now. Then your entire screen. Click, Click on in, uh, your entire screen. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Then now uh, minimize the Google Chrome. Yes, okay. Okay. Oh, yes, sir. Does it appear? Okay, clear. Can you see the PPT? Ah, yes, sir. Okay, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Okay, okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Busy person. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, development of a PhD thesis step by step. I have prepared three slides uh, just before half an hour. I was just to uh, discuss the things uh, with the page of points I had, uh, I mean, before me. But then again, I thought that uh, PPT is uh, now the habit of everyone uh, meeting here. And that is why I have uh, gone for this. There are only two PPT, I mean PowerPoint uh, slides here. The first one is this. Now, uh, let us uh, think of uh, these points. Since developing a research dissertation is uh, something that uh, does not have the fixed methods, as we discussed in the previous meeting fixed in the sense uh, they can be different methods applied by different universities and today I am going to <coughs> I'm sorry 
share with you only those things that are practically important or that are practically possible because uh, however hard we keep on trying that uh, thesis is this thesis is that everything that runs into theory uh, cannot give us the exact uh, knowledge of uh, putting the things into uh, practice unless we start practicing that theory that theory cannot be you know that way useful see the first step of uh, any kind of research whether say post graduation research project or maybe uh, educational dissertation or that of mphil or phd the most important thing for us is collection of primary data i have seen uh, or i have experienced uh, a few people working on phd or uh, even if i say uh, more of them it wouldn't be an exaggeration suppose an author has uh, uh, written or authored some 25 books and there are six textbooks selected for the phd work what the researcher does i mean my experience i am going to share with you is that <clears throat> i'm sorry he or she collects only those uh, books that are selected for the research and then that research work and then the rest of the books have been put at bay or they have been neglected this causes uh, a great damage to that research and it becomes but a half account of the research and that is why it is important that when we choose an author we should first of all look for all the material that is author that is produced by that author if it is 25 books we should have all of them not only this but for example that author has uh, been interviewed by someone so the record of that interview is a must that should be there and then if that author has uh, been presented uh, some way or the other maybe by way of uh, lecture or maybe by way of uh, a discussion debate etc even this kind of record should be available with us and we have many ways we have many options of uh, getting this available and uh, if we desire for that definitely most of the things run into us and for some of the things we have to try hard that is uh, the only difference but then when we have chosen an author it's important that we go for all the data i mean all the primary material the primary material is that which is produced by our subject who is our subject the author that we have chosen for our research work so it is important that we go for that so this data this primary data should be with us available there shouldn't be a single text missing from that here again we have one more provision for example one of the textbooks authored by that uh, writer has been so important but for example that is not available in the form of translation we can go for translation our own way but for example the language that that author writes in is not familiar to us for this kind of uh, thing we should uh, seek help from the people that are good at that language so that is also what we we should be doing when uh, for example proceeding for the research work this is the first step very first step and we find that uh, there are many books that are very hard to come by but then we can have these books available consulting various websites various people and even the people that belong to the area or geographical area of uh, that author this is possible 
and as I very often say to you, it is important to realize where there is a way, uh, there is a will, there is a way. Certainly, there is a way. So, the most important thing, the the very first step for us to develop our dissertation has been this. Uh, I would. Uh, like to tell you an interesting experience that a researcher I met uh, uh, got uh, awarded that degree but then while going through that process the research could not have uh, the original material to a perfect extent or to a complete uh, degree and still that that person could uh, go for uh, that work of course uh, work so hard but then ultimately exactly. what I realized was uh, that researcher uh, lacked uh, the original material to some extent I do not mean all but then this is not the way to go for it because this somehow damages the level of our confidence so this is important and then we have the secondary data for example, books, journals, papers, that is research papers, by and on, articles, by and on, newspapers. Sometimes we find that the newspapers publish interview and of course the news and also there are certain reviews on the books of or maybe on the uh, say literature of the author we have chosen there are also documentaries interviews films etc we should try to collect the secondary data as much as possible and there is no limit for this collection primary data has been limited limited in the sense if there are 10 books written by an author and we collect them all that is the limited data that we have got. Nothing beyond that 10, beyond that number. But when it comes to the secondary data, there is no limit at all. There can be, you know, ample material. But then again, yes, having had it, we have to also think of uh, choosing because choice out of that is very important. Suppose there are two books on that author, on our subject, on our topic which is more authentic which is more useful which is uh, more important should be selected by us this is again very important otherwise we have uh, for example uh, a number of articles maybe 50 on that author but we find that not all the 50 articles can be of use of, or, or equal significance for us and that is why we have to think of you know that material we have to make a choice out of that which is of great significance to us and the similar idea could be applied in regard with say the rest of the types of then we have uh, the case of reading. Reading has been of, uh, say, different kinds. There are some people who skim. There are some people who read. And there are some people, some others, who study. Study is the word that is very important. What is reading? We find that there are many people that read. When we travel, for example, by a railway compartment, or by a, a railway, when we are on travel, traveling by a train, or on a train, by a bus, we find that there are people with books into their hands, and they keep reading that. Can we consider it a serious kind of reading, which is required for the PhD thesis? then the answer would be mostly no because it is very difficult for most of the people to concentrate upon what they are reading in a public space, in a public sphere and that is why 
we have to make uh, sure that whatever we are reading has absolute sense and absolute gravity unless it is there we would not be able to uh, proceed further in our research pursuit another issue with the reading has been that mostly we find reading a tedious activity there are some books or some textbooks that do not interest us then it is quite possible that uh, we would read such textbooks half heartedly but then we have to take into consideration the fact that without reading that book seriously we are not going to draw certain important conclusions and uh, one more aspect that is associated with the uh, reading skill has been there are two types of reading one is primary and the second is secondary when we read a book we have these two kinds of response primary and secondary when a research work is going to be objective we have only one option and it is that of the secondary reading secondary response to the text on hand then what is primary reading we have certain books which uh, carry some sort of uh, sob themes or sob stories and these have been highly emotional they make the readers quite subjective this subjective approach or when a text makes you emotional is never never appropriate to a research work so here secondary response is very important the a teacher of mine used to say when giving example of these two kinds of responses did you read sham chi ai and then some said yes some uh, kept mum and those that said yes were questioned again did you weep while reading it and then most of the responses were yes we wept for some time and then the teacher said this is your primary response to that text later on uh, when we listened to the speech delivered by uttam kambhai i hope uh, most of you know him and his uh, piece of writing i samjhun geta at that time he had once said that my mother was quite ordinary but she was uh, more capable she was more hard working than the mother of sham but then he expressed uh, regret over say his text not taken care of as much as the one uh, by say sane guru ji now there are different angles to this uh, assessment which to pick is uh, dependent upon the reader and when we go through uttam kamale's text i samjhun geta we don't tend to uh, weep and even when we go to uh, sane guru ji's shamti etc we don't uh, tend to weep at all but it is possibly a kind of uh, psychological condition created by the teachers of literature which in fact makes the readers weep and respond to certain texts like that uh in a way that is highly emotional so emotion is never never workable when we go through say uh composition of a research when we go for composition of a research work that is what we have to understand and uh, as i even previously 
mentioned. Then we go for the theory of Wolfgang Iser. He has two types of reading having put to his readers. One is extensive reading and the other is intensive reading. Research demands intensive reading because it is on the basis of intensive reading and this is how I look at it. You may possibly find extensive reading more useful for your research. That is your experience. But my experience tells me that intensive reading helps us much more in uh, drafting or for drafting a good research thesis. So these are the ideas that uh, we can think of while going for it. Well, uh, most of the experiences of the researchers have been such that when they collect their data, they simply go on reading that material available to them. And that material is read out by them quite voraciously sometimes. And they do not make a single note upon a single text. They feel that since they have finished reading that text, they need not note down anything. But then, as the time passes on, and they find themselves in a condition of aporia, and this is Jack Derrida's term, aporia. Aporia is a French term for a situation of uncertainty, a situation of doubt. So this sense of aporia, again, uh, leaves that reader crestfall. Why? Because when that uh, researcher or reader starts writing something about the research topic, that researcher doesn't find the words on pages, how to start, how to write, then becomes the, uh, the basic issue for that uh, research. And that is why I would like to you know, put my opinion to you. that whenever you start reading anything, you do some things simultaneously. Read, and while reading, underline certain important sentences, number one, and also have a register with you in which to make notes. Note making is a very, very important step for building up a thesis. Because when we make notes, we can easily recall what we have already read, what we have already studied. Study is a kind of examination. Reading is a kind of uh, process that affords us satisfaction, entertainment, etc. See, reading a popular novel can give us pleasure. But Studying a popular novel can provide us an insight into the seriousness of topic or what kind of topic or what kind of material is produced by uh, you know that writer, popular writer, we can easily understand. And then uh, since it is popular, we do not find much interest in it. But then when we simply read it for the sake of reading, it entertains us best. So, whenever we read, we should make sure that we are not only reading, but we are studying that. And we start examining certain things. And there are some people who say that they can read a book maybe at one fifteen in one city and uh, maybe a night spent upon a text and that that text is read that is all but if you ask those people about the minute uh, say components of that text possibly they would largely fail 
at telling you those minute uh, pointing out those minute components i remember a friend of mine whose father was a scientist in hyderabad and he was so fluent in english and his reading skill was also uh, quite maybe photographic i do not know if uh, this is the proper term to describe that and i handed that uh, book of uh, american literature and anthology by george mcmichael and that textbook uh, carries as many as uh, around uh, 1500 pages and i told him that i needed that book uh, earlier and he said no problem he read it out uh, maybe within a span of 3 days that means 500 pages a day and i was uh, baffled i was surprised to see that he had finished reading that book completely and after maybe a day or two or maybe after a week when i asked him uh, whatever he has read and when i asked uh, certain questions on whatever he had read he was unable to provide uh, satisfactory answers to my questions so sometimes we can find such people so this is reading for the sake of reading uh, i would simply call it but when we turn our reading into study that is going to help us so much so that we can have a proper ground for developing our thesis writing and as i was speaking of uh, making notes these notes would help us a lot they can help us recall what we read previous and these notes also give us the details of what is there on whatever page number on whatever page so this is uh, a great benefit that we can have out of uh, making notes and then besides this we have to put down the quotations a textbook can provide as many important quotations maybe as a hundred and we cannot uh, apply all those hundred quotations to our thesis then what we do is again we start sorting out when we revise these quotations we automatically start to realize that these quotations are not that important and these are the preferable ones and that is how the process continues and that is how we have to understand it and again what we have to do is if we write the thoughts if we make whatever we are putting down in a handwriting form sorry handwritten form that is going to help us a lot in our days we have uh, uh, many facilities like uh, laptop and these equi- uh, this these kinds of uh, equipment for example a laptop is there and there is uh, an ebook reader that ebook reader is uh, available on amazon we have because even in that uh, on that device there is a facility of underlining the uh, text saving the underlined material etc but i think that is not that common a thing with uh, the academicians or the academic community. so we have that we have the reader we have uh, a laptop we have a mobile phone etc but since uh, i belong to a generation that has been brought up on the use of pen i prefer everything handwritten because writing can give us a very close sense of attachment with that book and if we go on typing the things uh, i wonder if uh, the similar sense could be had out of uh, the laptop and that is why handwritten things can help us a lot i believe then uh, more important is that we go for the the, the standard dictionaries 
I have some of the names that I have personally handled. Oxford, Longman, I mean these are the two dictionaries that can guide us well on the writing skill. Because whenever we start writing, we usually find ourselves in an entangled situation as to whether this sentence can be correct, uh, you know, cannot be determined by us. Is it grammatically appropriate? Is it uh, syntactically, semantically appropriate, etc. And there is also the issue of qualifications. And then the registers as well, whether it is formal, informal, whether it is a dialectal term, etc. So the dictionary, a good dictionary can always help us in this respect. Longman and Oxford have done a lot of work on this issue. Any research work completed without the use of dictionary may be lacking. I would say, uh, you know, must be lacking. I, I, I beg your pardon for this emphatic auxiliary motor. But then, it must be lacking in uh, in the in connecting the sense of language, and that is why constant visits to a good dictionary can help us a lot. So that is also what we have to do. Then we have to maintain consistency. What is this? It is about language. I have already spoken of this spelling, formal content and coherence. Coherence is uh, one of the most significant areas of uh, a research thesis. Without coherence, no research work can be considered logical. If coherence is there, then that thesis is to be considered as a good one. Now again, there are the issues, the problems. As to whether to begin with the, the first chapter or the last chapter, when last is to be produced at last. But then the first, second, third, fourth, which chapter can be, uh, say for example, easy for me to deal with, I should make a choice. Suppose I have the third chapter which becomes quite easier for me and I feel that I can draft this third chapter quite well if I begin with that. Then there are certain benefits this choice puts forth to me. And what are these benefits? Number one, that can give me the level of confidence. That once I have done with it, then I can feel that, yes, I can deal with other chapters now quite well. It is just an experience similar to an examination, uh, say, session. For example, a question paper is there, five questions are there on it. I have to begin with uh, maybe the third question, which happens to be quite easy for me to deal with. And the first, equally difficult. If I begin with the first question, I may lose my confidence. And again, the question that is easy for me would become difficult. Why? Because the confidence level has uh, might come down because I attempted or I have attempted the question that is not my first hand choice. So better I go for question number three and then move back to the other ones. If I do it, then I can systematically, even the difficult questions under such circumstances come out as easier ones. A similar case can be taken for granted when drafting a thesis. For example, you have already spelt out 
the outline of your thesis and uh, even the names of chapters have been decided by you and while going through the material that is available all of a sudden we, we get certain insights or maybe at regular intervals we have different insights but if there's an insight that prompts us to go for a chapter that is in the middle we should certainly go for that we shouldn't hesitate because that is going to help us a lot so here i would like to say when writing a research thesis when when producing a dissertation we should choose the chapter that interests us most this is again a point that we should consider then i shall uh, get uh, to another slide and here it is uh, the preparation of the thesis see unless you have completely gone through the primary or secondary material you may not have a proper setup of mind proper confidence level to begin writing mostly we find that there are people that struggle with uh, uh, you know beginning of uh, writing because of the four skills writing happens to be the toughest and when you start writing at that time only you start realizing how difficult it has been to be a writer how to begin where to begin and what are the issues to begin with i mean these are the questions that a researcher is always faced with and the first chapter happens to be a kind of a take see the first chapter can be best drafted at the end of our research work if we go by that way but then if you feel that you are more comfortable with beginning with the first chapter do not hesitate beginning with it don't listen to what others say just listen to your own conscience if your conscience tells you that you can best produce the first chapter definitely go for that and if your conscience asks you to begin with the first chapter in the end you should uh, follow your conscience rather than anybody else and you can convince your supervisor that you are comfortable with the first chapter to be produced first or at the end then uh, certainly the supervisor will allow you for doing this so it is important to realize what you can begin with best and that is what you have to do there now see there are certain ways of uh, beginning a thesis see these are the things for example title page abstract and contents and there are also other pages like uh, certificate by the supervisor declaration by the researcher there is also a page of dedication etc and generally we are advised to prepare all these things and uh, one one more uh, thing that i uh, forgot to mention is acknowledgments etc mostly we are advised to do these things at the end acknowledgments yes we can get it done at the end quite comfortably but if you feel that you can also do that page well in advance step by step for example you have created your title page abstract will have to be produced at the end no doubt about it but if you feel that uh, this is the uh, you know synoptic structure of your thesis that is already on your mind don't hesitate to prepare even that abstract because that is not go into the final abstract at all you can revise it time and again and particularly when the, the whole of the document is ready 
So title, page, abstract and content. So if you think that you can go with this quite comfortably and uh, yes, uh, proceed further, go for that, do it. Because here, uh, self decision is very important. Of course, that decision has to be shared with the supervisor so that we can have more ideas about that. And what you are psychologically comfortable with should be undertaken and practiced. So, we can begin with the title page, abstract and contents. Who knows what ideas these, uh, you know, trifle things, trifle in the sense uh, compared to the contents, the main contents of the thesis. Or these easy things, rather than trifle, let us uh, put this term that is easy. I mean, these easy things, if you think, can uh, pave the path for your further progress, go for that. No problem at all. Because there are ways with which one can be comfortable. And then, yes, when preparing the first chapter, for example, if you are beginning with the first chapter, look after these things. The rationale is very important. Why did you choose this topic? Think it over for a long time. And once you have a proper idea of your rationale understood, then get understood also that rationale is going to give you a certain various uh, say steps to systematize your contents and that is why rationale forms the soul of your thesis in short and then we have also the significance of the topic what is the significance of it for example uh, you're dealing with the issues of uh, a great concern or serious concerns there are serious concerns then you can very often tell yourself that the significance of your topic is this and that is why it is important that uh, you develop it in accordance with the framework that you have uh, possibly prepared for yourself and then we have aims and objectives why have you chosen your goal like this why have you chosen your objectives like this then proper study I mean visiting again and again your aims and objectives rationale and significance of the topic can facilitate the process of writing and for this you, you know uh, we are required uh, we as the researchers are required to say do a lot of rough work because research work is not going to be finalized at once for example I as a researcher feel that uh, this is the rationale upon which I could uh, write maybe two or three pages actually rationale is always put within one paragraph or maybe within two or three lines that is quite possible but suppose I feel that I can uh, write much upon rationale then I can have a pen and paper and start writing upon my rationale so rationale is this that that and having produced three pages then again I can find that there are some more ideas to develop my rationale in another way it, it doesn't remain rational only but then the development of the process the significance of the topic visit it again and again well this is the significance of my topic I found in the beginning but this significance can also be put otherwise and then out of that with the help of certain textbooks if I as a researcher can elaborate upon the significance of the topic 
then that would be you know uh, another step to develop the first chapter that way and then aims and objectives i should realize what was my aim and if that aim was there then this aim should be applied to the textbooks can it fit into that frame in which the textbooks are put can i be able to meet the objectives on the basis of the textbooks i have chosen and then again i can start writing rough pages and hypothesis i discussed last time can be there or cannot be but if we have uh, some hypotheses they can also help us find out many and more things in the books that we go through for example my hypothesis is that there is partiality cultural partiality in the textbooks of so and so author and then whenever i read that text i have that hypothesis pursuing me yes these are the dialogues this is the description this is the narration that can support my thesis so if we uh, you know if we, while reading the text or the textbooks we have uh, chosen how these major things on our mind we would naturally have scope for putting extensive uh, say description or extensive analysis rather than description of these major things for example uh, on rational as i said some three pages significance of the topic some three pages aims and objectives then can be extended into maybe five pages and even hypothesis can be extended into one or two pages so this is how we can begin keep on writing i mean whatever we read think it over meditate upon it and then try writing something about that and if you try writing something about that then it would be giving as an incentive for you so important that we use reading and writing simultaneously if we read at once and write at the other time this is never go into help us and then second time while reading and writing it may cause us irritation so it is very important that you make rough notes it is very important that you make a rough analysis of whatever we read of whatever we study and the most important thing for us is that whatever we write should be connectable to our topic should be connectable to our aims and objectives or hypothesis i mean hypothesis is not uh, a necessary thing to prove a hypothesis can be proven right or wrong so hypothesis can keep changing it is a fluid thing but aims and objectives cannot change this is what we have to understand rational of the thesis it cannot change either and significance of the topic possibly may change for example today it is an issue of great relevance tomorrow it may not be because the circumstances have changed but then aims and objectives and rational are the things that do not change because you have based your choice of the author title or topic and uh, your textbooks upon them and that is why they do not change then we have the review of literature suppose i read a review of a textbook which is part of my research actually review does not have limit of time for example 
A textbook upon the author I chose was produced as a review maybe some 20 years ago or maybe 30 years ago. I can still use it while reviewing it in my first chapter, in the first chapter of my thesis. But we, we, we need not uh, put it like this, review of literature, because this is the usual method of uh, putting review that is uh, that pertains to, say, social sciences, etc., or even other subjects or other disciplines. But when a research work is based upon literature, uh, a literary author, then we need not go for that, you know, as uh, specially or especially as uh, we find the case of uh, social science. And there is no time. Well, let me come back to my point of view. Suppose I have read a review of the text that is part of my research work. I cannot go blindly for that review. I should determine whether my ideas or analytical ideas of mine match that of the reviewer or not. If they do, yes, there can be some kind of uh, similar common review can produce or I can produce. But suppose that review carry certain contradictions because the perception of that review uh, is different from that of mine. Then naturally, my review of that book, my analysis of that book would radically change. And while reviewing that literature, I have to take care of this and I should categorically mention that this review says this and those things but going at so and so say page paragraph or narration description the facts are like this this is actually the successful assessment of a review a review of a review but if we blindly follow what someone has said put it and we haven't commented upon that, then it is not going to contribute significantly to our work. Then what else can we do with this review? Suppose I have uh, studied a review of a textbook, I should instantly have my pen and start writing notes upon that review. This would again develop the written material of mine because uh, the thesis and you know actually it a PhD thesis has uh, the limitation of uh, pages nowadays it can be up to 250 pages 250 pages previously there was no limit to the size of that thesis but today we have to follow the guidelines uh, set by our university. But then, suppose I have uh, to produce a thesis that runs into 250 pages and the written work that I have already uh, produced has maybe around 1000 pages. Then again the question stands out as to how to limit it up to a length of 250 pages. Then we can go through our writing again and again and then reducing the size and some deletion, uh, you know, some omission, etc. can be done. And what is, uh, say, more precise can be chosen by me for my thesis. So, 200 and 50 pages, if I were to do this, I will have to again uh, apply this method of reduction and it is important to do it. But suppose the, I have to produce a thesis which runs into uh, 250 pages and uh, what I have written is just uh, maybe 200 pages. 
then how to deal with this it becomes an issue of concern so there's another way that we read more and we try to expand our rough work as much as possible this is again a way for example if i can take this i can convert this 200 into maybe uh, 300 400 etc then it becomes easy for me to have a choice of the limited uh, draft otherwise minimum pages maximum requirement uh, would be a kind of dilemma for us so this is how we have to again uh, deal with that then we have also to think of possibility of further research can my research be useful for the posterity the future generations suppose i have chosen an area of uh, say post colonial studies or post colonial field and i have interpreted it uh, with a view to say south asian culture or indian culture or say the horizons of uh, maybe certain colonial or post colonial countries this is just an example then i have to also uh, you know take into consideration the fact if there can be a possibility open by the research work for for the research see this usually happens in the areas of uh, caste race ethnicity and certain other serious social issues because an individual has certain limitations to deal with these issues sometimes the issues that this researcher or this individual has chosen can be synchronic limited to a particular time then what next then this research work can provide a way out so this is again possibility of further research one can develop in a thesis and a research work should not be uh, limited or it should not be what we call it uh, i think that word is uh, endogamous uh, i am not sure about it it should be open ended a research work should always be open ended if it doesn't have an open end then it would be kind of stagnation after some time so possibility of further research is one of the most important uh, say phenomena of research work because if my research work can inspire others to carry it forward in other form and that is the real success of my research work but you know there are some people whose research work is uh, maybe completed the degree has been got awarded and never never is that research work referred to by anyone that is read out but that is not referred to what is the use of that research work there should be at least some people referring to that research work and if it happens it means that that research work has opened possibility of further research how can we do it that is the question possibility we have to think of well if i present my thesis my argument in this and that fashion it would also open further ways for somebody to look into this area and while doing this when i read a text of the author i have chosen then i can make a rough draft of this issue as well, possibility what can be the possibility so if i go this way this can be a possibility if i go that way this can be a possibility 
So if I produce some uh, two or three pages on this point, that is possibility, naturally it can open some scope for, say, further research. And this is very important. I, I spoke of uh, scope and limitation in previous lectures. That's why I have uh, not uh, repeated those points. I also spoke of, uh, say, uh, pedagogical implications, etc. I didn't repeat that point. But then possibilities can be uh, looked at this way. And whatever point that we come up, whatever point we come across should be elaborated on by us. It should be elaborated. See, I have uh, all of a sudden come across some idea that may not be associated with my research work. But I found it useful. I can put inside uh, put it inside my thesis and then i can instantly start writing upon it as well so whatever point appears before us uh, should be written upon analytically by us or uh, even uh, simplistic uh, you know analysis of it can work in this regard now let us move on to the area of english language teaching and linguistics elt that we call See, practical research is possible in ELT and linguistics. In ELT, it is highly possible. Not only possible, but it becomes compulsory. Because English language teaching is an area which makes us do a lot of field work. And there are many, many problems. The people do not allow us access. Even if we make a statement to them, a written statement, the data will be strictly kept confidential, etc. The people are not ready to offer data. And this is a major issue across our country. And that is why research in the area of English language teaching uh, does not prosper. And methodologies of uh, English language teaching, etc., do not get generated out of our culture. And we have to borrow these methodologies from the states like uh, uh, America or UK, etc. Why? Because we do not have the experience of how to deal with the community that is available to us, community of students. And when we try to apply the methodologies that have been generated by the Americans, the Europeans, etc., they may not be exactly applicable, or they may not be mostly applicable, maybe applicable up to 10 or 20 percent. Why? Because their, sample, their samples are different, their subjects are different, subjects in the sense the people upon whom the research work is based. And then this research becomes a case of mere formality. So ELT is a very important area in our subject, but that has always remained in long neglect, I'm sorry to say. Well, research in ELT and linguistics has been highly practical, experimental. And we have the terms like qualitative and quantitative research or data or techniques or methods used in these two areas mostly. We have also other terms like sample, question, interviews. See, qualitative research is always part of literary research. That is where we deal, and uh, that is uh, how we deal with literature, qualitative. And quantitative data is always a matter of experimental, of field-based research work. For example, I have to test uh, 
the second language, English as a second language, then I would uh, determine the level of the students, primary, then post-primary, high school, higher secondary school, undergraduates, postgraduates, and teaching community. I can also have different kinds of examples like uh, business community then elders, age-wise, uh, various professionals, etc. So multiple choices are there. The choice is multiple. And while dealing with my research in regard with these people, I have to collect the data in the form of quantity. And it is said, at least 20% of the sample should be there. When I deal with the 1,000 samples, then I have to work upon at least 200 out of it. Because first of all, I have to choose a major community. At a school, there are 1,000 students, or maybe at a college, then I can base my research upon the 20% of them, and that data collected, worked upon, analyzed, and then these samples tested, I also provide questionnaires. So here, there are oral testing, uh, there are types of tests like oral testing, written tests, and uh, also other kinds of tests. And I also provide questionnaires. I also interview uh, the given community upon which my research, the research is based. Suppose you have worked in the area of English language teaching. How to begin your thesis again becomes an issue. So, again, it is important. Whatever we do, we should keep on taking the notes. Every step, instantly note it down. By that, uh, you know, method we can successfully deal with that. We also have the area of linguistics. Suppose. Uh, uh, a psycholinguistic study of uh, so and so geography, or maybe the people in the district of Jalna, in the region of Maratwara, etc. Then again, it would be a matter of quantitative data. In the rest of the cases, linguistic research can be qualitative. Then we have to resort to statistics and all that. Suppose I have tested. Uh, maybe 200 samples, the data is ready with me, then how to analyze it, I should think of it. And while thinking of it, I should uh, start writing about it. Maybe some students were, uh, you know, not uh, responsive, some were poor, some were intelligent, clever, competent. I mean, these are the terms that I can put on the page. And then I can start developing my chapter, the chapter of thesis. Testing the questionnaires, I can have the data acquired and then upon it I can start writing as to what kind of answers, what kind of ability to answer certain questions and all that was there with the people etc. And then I can instantly write my conclusions there. So, whatever we study, whatever we test, should be put into writing. That is the way of developing it. Even interview can help us a lot. How one spoke, what kind of pronunciation, what kind of syntax, what kind of semantics, what kind of grammar, what kind of understanding. I mean, all these issues can be instantly noted down. Suppose I have tested my samples today or I have interviewed my subjects today and I have collected the data and put into maybe the drawers of my table and I wish to deal with that maybe after a month, then I would be missing a lot many things, a lot many important things from my analysis. and. Uh, the fresher we do it, I mean, if we do it in a fresh manner, 
as soon as possible with the immediate effect the better it becomes for us so again if someone is working in the area of uh, elt or uh, linguistics this is the way to develop arguments this is the way to elaborate on what we have worked upon so this is how again uh, we can do it now more important thing uh, is here the first draft no draft of thesis and no first draft of the thesis can be fine suppose i have uh, produced as many as 300 pages first of all i have to think what is uh, to be deleted and what is to be maintained and after that whatever i have written i should check whether it maintains coherence and internal consistency is my writing consistent with my topic i can easily test if if the topic is clear to me i can easily test it every time while uh, you know assessing my first draft i can go back to my title and try to see if it coheres with it if it is consistent with the topic and if it is not then what could make consistency there these are the things worth remembering and worth doing so first of all checking coherence I mean, coherence we understand suppose we have written a paragraph that runs into 10 lines and we know the skills of paragraph writing the first line which is called title title line itself is it completely in consonance with the title the second line does it continue the theme of the first line the third line does it carry forward the theme of the second line the fourth line is it in consonance with the previous three lines and the fifth line for example my conclusion is this conclusion closely associated with the previous lines and the title in particular this is how coherence can be tested otherwise writing on and on maybe what uh, james joyce has done the stream of consciousness that stream of consciousness is very useful highly productive in a literary area but it is not in the area of research as i was speaking about somebody's uh, reading habit there's a person who can read one text within a night another person for whom at least a week's time is required to read that the, that very text then we can consider that the second kind of reader has stops and pauses has thinking has uh, you know some kind of consideration and that is why that much time is being consumed by that person second person the first kind of reader it continuously read maybe under some kind of uh, influence or impression and maybe uh, the, the the you know crux of the matter may not lie with that person but the second person is if if you ask me to complete uh, a textbook within 2 days i would always fail at doing that why because after every paragraph or after every page i have the habit of uh, stopping and thinking what i have read and what is there so i am a poor reader let me confess to you i cannot move on and when you study the philosophical texts particularly when you study the texts of dr ambedkar let me come back to that example when i read his textbooks i mean uh, at the most 
I would be able to read 20 pages from his text within a day, not more than that. 20 can be greater number, a greater number. It can be 10 more comfortable. Why? Because every word, every statement of this writer, that is Dr. Ambedkar, makes me stop and think. When I go through a text like uh, Lajja by, say, Taslim Manasri, I, I uh, completed reading that text uh, maybe within three days. I was so happy that I could uh, finish that text within three days. I underlined, I quoted, I, I pointed out certain quotes, etc. It was possible. I was in that great flow. But today, I do not have a single text uh, to be read with that speed. When you study uh, certain theorists, for example, Jack Derrida, I would be wonderstruck if someone uh, comes forward with the idea that or experience that Jack Derrida, Derrida's structure, sign, and play a very uh, in a limited kind of essay as compared to the rest of his uh, writings. Structure, sign, and play in the discourses of human science, for example. And uh, that person says, I have gone through this uh, within one hour or two hours, etc. I would be wonderstruck, as I said uh, already. Why? Because uh, Derrida is a bit more complex. I mean, he is not difficult to understand, or, or, or he is not impossible to understand, let me put it otherwise. But certainly, Derrida uh, requires a lot of patience to understand. If that patience is there, we can understand Derrida. Otherwise, uh, there is already a complex of fear gifted by our teachers to us. Derrida is so difficult to understand. Derrida is way beyond our reach. We cannot understand, etc. And we go with that kind of mentality. Sometimes we sacrifice reading Derrida. This happens. Well, that is not my point. What I exactly mean is the theories like Derrida are uh, slightly tough to deal with and we require a lot of patience and uh, when we study them and maintain that patience Hello, afterwards we would Hello. be able to draft something Hello. 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 and Hello. unless we have it uh, Sunday, you know, that, that patience Hello. spent Hello. upon or applied etc we cannot come to uh, say uh, coherence of understanding. So my point is checking coherence and uh, finding out internal consistency. Am I consistent with presenting my research work, or are there disconnects? Are there ruptures? This has to be tested while the first draft is ready. Then proofreading. We understand. This is one of uh, the most boring, uh, you know, jobs. Proofreading. First of all, I should see if I can make proofreading of my text or do proofreading of my text. The text in the sense, uh, the written material. So first of all, I should proofread it. And when I am done and proofreading, I will have to do maybe at least two or three times. This is a very good habit. What we write should be read at least three times. Then, if we, because every time we read it, it is a new reading and there are different perspectives so we can change uh, the structure and uh, the contents etc not only that we also keep on changing uh, grammatical setup of what we have 
written. So first time we worked upon spelling, second time we worked upon grammar and spellings. Third time we worked upon spellings, grammar, consistency, coherence, and even uh, say, vocabulary. Uh, now third time is possibly the limit. And then when I am done, I should hand it to another expert for proofread. And having done with that expert, we can then finally hand it to a supervisor. Proofreading is a must. Go through many of the pieces that are available uh, to us, maybe on a website like Shodgan Rights. We find that uh, the syntax and semantics of the thesis have always been problematic. Most of the pieces we can find. Having been uh, uh, you know, faced with this, but if uh, we go for uh, the, the thesis of, say, certain standard, uh, uh, reputed rather than standard, institutes and universities, for example, uh, let me again come to that point. Research work at a central university has been so meticulous. It has been meticulously done. And the supervisors have been so, <coughs> I'm sorry, sharp at getting it done appropriately. So this is a big advantage I consider for those students. But in the rest of the cases, or maybe most of the cases, I wouldn't say rest of the cases, it would be a wrong premise to put before you. Proofreading you know, has been a major issue. And then finally we can hand it to the supervisor. So the first draft, when produced, should be tested, read by a surplus three times. And then these are the matters. Go here, consistency, proofreading. We can assess during these three readings or revisions of that draft. And finally, the supervisor or the guide will determine what to do with it. And then we have chapterization. The ideal thesis, at least to me, is that which uh, runs between the first and the fifth chapters. If you try to extend it beyond that, there is no restriction if uh, the demand is there. But then, this is the most general setup of the thesis, structure of the thesis. First to the fifth, the first to the fifth. And then, conclusion is what actually determines the fate of our thesis. And that is a completely new formation. The first chapter repeats many ideas. For example, we have a review, we have biographical details of the writer, we have the background, etc. These can be found elsewhere in many places. The second, third and fourth are the chapters in which we make a comment upon content. This is the term I, I have derived from uh, you know, that uh, literary theorist, Roland Barthes, a French theorist, whose essay, Criticism as Language, tells us that criticism is nothing but a comment upon content. All right, that is not uh, objectionable at all because it is a matter of analysis. Unless we make a comment upon comment, analysis cannot be the output. But then conclusion is a chapter which is absolutely new. Because 
this only belongs to ourselves. We haven't derived from anyone anything. All the ideas that we present in this chapter happen to be our own. So, what we say in, in accordance with the uh, say, uh, who is that? Uh, Foucault, Michel Foucault. What is an author that is, uh, you know, the piece of text he has produced? What is an author? And we also have uh, another title by Roland Barthes, The Death of Author. So Roland Barthes says, once a textbook comes into your hand, the author dies there. Whereas Michel Foucault says something different. Both the French critics have uh, different opinions. And what is an author? Uh, you know, Michel Foucault tells us that the author is everything. And uh, the author is the ultimate authority of a text. Similarly, we can say we are the author of conclusion. Why in the rest of the thesis, we are just like a critic. But in the conclusion, we are just like a writer or an author. Because the conclusions have been are of whatever conclusions we draw. They belong to us. They solely belong to us. And this chapter actually determines the quality of our thesis. Because conclusion is always in consonance with the, the arguments presented in the earlier chapters. It is all about uh, meeting aims and objectives. It is all about uh, seeing whether the hypotheses are proven right or wrong. And that is how you know, the final chapter has been. But this chapter is to be produced at the end of the uh, you know, fourth chapter, or maybe the penultimate chapter. Rather than fourth, I would use that term, penultimate. Last but one in the language of sports. So this uh, chapter, that is conclusion, has to be produced after the penultimate chapter. And then that is the essence of our thesis. And we can draw many conclusions. Initially, we can have a point list of conclusions. This is my conclusion about this chapter, about that chapter, etc. And maybe there are as many as 20 odd points. And finally, we can consolidate those points and present them as a monolithic block. Conclusion is like this. So the first draft begins with the introduction and it concludes with conclusion. And in between, there is a lot that happens. And sometimes we also find that our thesis undergoes a sea change, possible. When, I mean, see here, the more we read, the more changes are there. Rather than sea change, I would say, and there is a vast change we, uh, you know, undertake or we bring about in our thesis. There are some people who think more reading is required, more in the sense, uh, you know, maybe two years uh, time is not sufficient. So the reading should go on. The more you read, uh, the greater the length of uh, time your thesis would consume. So it is very important to be specific, to set a limit to our thesis is very important. If the limit is not chalked out, then that research work would never, never come to completion. And that is why we should already design it. This is the way. And 
this is the beginning point and this is the end point of it by then it is possible and sometimes uh, we also get carried away by the ideas presented by others someone would come to us and say well this is not uh, a better analysis you should have put this into that you should have added this you should have read uh, you know that book and we start feeling diffident so better to keep ourselves limited to our research supervisor rather than somebody else you know there's a saying in english too many cooks together spoil the broth so better to get limited to one cook and that is our research supervisor or the guide the the more the people you contact and consult the greater the confusion they would cause so better you keep your research work limited to yourself and your research supervisor otherwise uh, it would never never come to completion it would never come to a close close in the promises so we have to somehow determine the the ending line and that is how we can do. at the end again it is uh, the matter of bibliography appendix in appendix you can put in photographs interviews questions etc actually conducted but whenever we have to begin writing a thesis the best way is making rough notes of what paper we read putting down the quotations i showed you a research card you know, an example of research card the last time also uh, another page of analysis of a text unless this is done uh, there wouldn't be anything because we do not have a magic wand held by aladdin we do not have that genie with us so what we have to do is because uh, this is uh, a process which is not uh, which does not uh, run fast this is a slow process it begins slowly it catches some kind of pace in the middle and finally again it slows down so better as we run short of time every say on every occasion better whatever we read should be produced in the form of notes produced in the form of uh, quotation marks and yes conclusions and whatever we feel like uh, thinking or we feel like writing it say that should be simply put into the page we should uh, maintain a diary for this purpose with us that can help us coming back home we can uh, uh, for example shift the points of diary into the regular uh, note making register or you know uh, the ruling pages etc unless you begin reading and writing simultaneously this is cannot be developed and if you still believe that you can do without this yes you certainly can but these are in fact uh, the experiential ways i have shared with you i do not know how far i have uh, spoken relevantly but still i felt uh, that this kind of sharing can be helpful to you. so again i would like to say reading and writing is a, a you know form a simultaneous process for uh, you know uh, uh, an easy way of uh, say progressing further uh, any kind of detachment or any kind of gap between the two can make the things more complex so with this again i would like to say 
I am so much grateful to the organizers for this opportunity and uh, I was really happy to be in communication with you on this platform that is uh, uh, Google Meet and uh, I'm not sure up to what extent I have made sense but uh, I feel that uh, I have put some useful ideas to me. Yes. You I am grateful to my friend Mr. Mandi who is here. And also uh, every member from the audience. I am really grateful to you all for being with me and having given me patient listen. With this again I say I am grateful to each one of you and would be happy to receive questions from your end. Thank you very much. Thank you sir. Thank you so much. Uh, participants are uh, requested to you know raise your questions, ask doubts, any queries Please. Good evening, sir. This is Amul. Uh, ah, Good yes, Amul. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. How are you doing? First of all, uh, yeah, I would like to thank you. You have uh, narrated how are the what are the steps and uh, what are the precautions that we have been using gadgets. And uh, yeah, uh, you are taking rough notes. Uh, I think I should take it seriously and I should write the uh, rough notes in black and white back to in my diary or in my notebook. We have been using this uh, gadgets, laptops to write down the notes and somewhere down the line that we forget. We have written it somewhere. We have been or we have to use it at some point of uh, the time. And the second thing is uh, my point was while uh, doing this uh, research simultaneously can we check it uh, in some software uh, in in terms of finding out its plagiarism or a point of references which would uh, help us to reduce uh, the context of plagiarism that would affect our uh, research at end point of time I mean after writing one chapter we find it that uh, it seems or writing the complete thesis we find it that uh, it's of no use so simultaneously while writing something about our research can we have some reference ready reference that it is uh, it comes under that uh, view of plagiarizing plagiarizing plagiarism <coughs> well uh, are you done Yes, sir. Okay. If you are completely sure that your first chapter has been revised by you time and again, and it is almost final to be submitted to your supervisor, for example, okay, you can go for the software for anti-plagiarism. There is another name for this software, but I don't remember it. Similarity is a kind of word that is used, uh, finding similarity of, uh, say, writing this or something like that. Anyway, let me have freedom of calling it anti-plagiarism software. If you okay. think that uh, you uh, now have done with, the, say, reading the first chapter, you are done with it, okay? okay. Now you, you cannot do anything, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, further to be added to that 
that time you can apply that software otherwise the better option is let your thesis be complete and then apply the whole of it uh, you know to that software otherwise if uh, you have prepared your first chapter you have prepared a rough draft of it and uh, you haven't gone through it for a second or third time and if you apply <coughs> i'm sorry that software to this there's uh, a possibility that it would uh, somehow break the level of your confidence so yes. the best thing is to completely go for that i mean completion of your chapter or your thesis and at the end check plagiarism okay yes. this is how i would like to respond to this okay thank you thank you very much sir thank you very uh ah sir actually uh, you told that uh, uh 250 pages is the limit ah uh. or uh, thesis so uh, what is the minimum pages uh it can be uh, 200 minimum 200 okay sir mm. thank you sir thank you uh-huh. Uh, so this is Vinod, sir. Ah uh, yes, please. yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for such a meticulous uh, session. And uh, once again, uh, I personally feel that uh, I was just thinking how research is so serious uh, activity. And uh, as you right from the reading habit and how to read. you have explained uh, thoroughly in your uh, session uh, so i have two questions uh, one is about the uh, multi- multilingual resources uh, for example suppose uh, i have been working on uh, mahatma phule and dr baba saheb ambedkar uh, most of the material uh, about dr baba saheb ambedkar we find in english uh, that is no uh, issue with me uh, but when we uh, find the resources about Uh, mahatma phule mm. then uh, it is mostly in marathi mm. that is of course in english but uh, mostly uh, find in uh, marathi mm. then how can i uh, take my references whether i can take <coughs> references from only english or in marathi suppose and you have to ha dira- uh, yes carry on please yes and the uh, second question is regarding uh, last uh, chapter Uh, as we mentioned that uh, conclusion is absolutely new mm. and uh, that is uh, thoroughly uh, it's a writer's uh, conclusion mm. so question is uh, can we use a reference in that or without reference we can go for a conclusion uh, see uh, if you uh, i shall deal with your last question first and then come to the first one later yes <coughs> let us reverse the order uh, see there can be conclusion supported with uh, evidence but then quotations are not expected to be put into uh, your conclusion you can make a reference for example uh, Uh, here the author has uh, presented this issue quite vitally at gb shorters if you wish to refer to gb shaw in your conclusion you can do it but you need not provide uh, a quotation of gb shaw in it that is uh, how you can do it second thing is that uh, nowadays it has been a trend that uh, a conclusion of a research thesis will go without any referencing or any citation so if that is uh, the most welcome thing about uh, this chapter that is conclusion uh, better we go for that uh, without uh, say uh, referencing and citation 
this is how I would like to respond to it. While in my thesis, I had uh, also used references in the final chapter. But then uh, conclusions were solely mine. And that is why possibly the examiners did not point it out. Having realized that uh, the conclusions belong to the researcher, uh, possibly they did not think it uh, you know, what we can say worthwhile to point uh, you know, my references out. But then when we go for the books, etc., the last chapter of a book has been uh, conclusion itself. And that also carries uh, quotations and references, uh, etc. But a book is different from what a thesis is. So better go without uh, references and uh, citations to make it more and more a product of your own or to make it look more and more a product of your own is it clear yes sir thank you uh, the first question that you put uh, uh, has been quite interesting and this has been usually uh, the problem of uh, uh, many researchers that work uh, on bilingual or maybe uh, vernacular uh, literature, uh, say the writers, the writers that have mostly produced their writings, they have done that. See, Mahatma Phule's writings, as you have rightly pointed out, uh, have been translated into English and even writing upon Mahatma Phule have also, uh, has also appeared in English. But then still there are certain textbooks or certain maybe quotes that we wish to derive that are solely in Marathi. One option that we can uh, apply here is take out, for example, a quotation or a paragraph or an argument as it is, translate it into English on your own and produce it in your thesis, putting at the end into brackets, words like translation mine or translation by the researcher. And you can move further. So this is a way to do with it. We can also work upon a Marathi text fully. But then uh, this is not welcomed by the traditional, uh, say, supervisors or examiners etc they would point it out that since this book is into marathi how can you work upon it in english but then uh, we can work on it if we wish but then the problems have been that uh, it hasn't been uh, commonly accepted and that is why we can resort to such kind of thing. We cannot uh, derive the whole of it into English. Otherwise, it would be a work of translation. So better pick up or derive a paragraph, a sentence, an argument, in, uh, you know, from that text, translate it into your own English, produce it, produce it into the thesis, and point it out that this has been translated by you. That is the way to deal with uh, the issue of language. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, sir. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, sir, uh, my question is, uh, Sir, uh, I have selected six novels of an American author, uh, D.C. Boyle, for my research. In my proposal, I had prepared uh, six chapters in which I intended to take two novels per chapter for the analysis of eco-critical perspective of the author. Okay. However, now, after going into the details of eco-critical theory, I now realize that there are some basic areas 
like uh, live places uh, which are called as bioregionalism uh, deep ecology environmental ethics eco feminism post humanism and animalism mm-hmm. and one more is eco linguistics mm-hmm. that i can explore through separate chapters mm-hmm. now i have two questions uh, based on this uh, one is uh, do i have to read all 17 novels because i have selected six novels do i have to read all the 17 novels and 11 short story co- collections that are, are written by this author mm. as you mentioned earlier mm. and uh, second is can i change my chapters exploring single area like deep ecology or eco feminism or other uh, such areas in different chapters mm. w- which one would be appropriate sir uh, see <coughs> when you choose a particular writer and uh, maybe a few texts like you have said six you have chosen out of uh, many 17 17 definitely you will have to read the whole of uh, literature produced by that author uh, okay. that is basically expected and mm-hmm. because you know uh, you have eco feminism or uh, yes. you know eco- ecology or uh, even so the certain other things that you have mentioned available in other textbooks at yeah. the time of your uh, viva voce if the referee asks you a question have you gone through that text and if you say no okay. it would be considered as uh, uh, you know Uh, as a limited research work or limited point of view and uh, okay. the the examiner would not be happy uh, with your research work and that is basically okay. expected when you work upon one author see to it that all the works written by that author and available in the language you want them to be uh you go for the whole of the corpus okay and then it can not only help you develop your confidence level but also mm-hmm. uh, provide certain scope for you to develop your thesis uh, on a better ground this okay. is uh, answer you know this is my response to your first question a uh, second question i think uh, was about what uh, could you please ah uh, uh, yes say uh, the condition of uh, a research work has been you cannot change the main title of your thesis okay. however you are at some liberty to make internal changes maybe okay. internal uh, changes like uh, change of the chapter name etc but then this mm-hmm. you cannot do without uh, your supervisor's permission uh-huh. if you yes everything that you do of this kind supervisor stands as uh, the main person yes. you know responsible for allowing changes not only that but also to take responsibility of your thesis okay and that is why uh, that has to be mutually done internal yes. changes you can do but with prior permission of the supervisor yes uh, you know unfortunately uh, you know i'm not speaking in the context of you but we find that there are many clashes between uh, the researcher and the supervisor as we find uh, in uh, some places but then uh, there has to be a healthy relationship between the supervisor and uh, you know, that research so that yes. it can smooth the flow of research work and uh, yes i believe if uh, the researcher time and again uh, consults the supervisor and also yes. shares ideas and uh, seeks certain kinds of permission naturally a good rapport between the two can be established 
and then the supervisor can be ready for allow such kind of changes otherwise yeah. sometime the supervisor may be adamant on okay. asking you to do the things as were planned in the beginning and research ethics tell us that a researcher should always uh, seek permission of uh, the guide or supervisor while doing the, the things of this sort okay yes sir actually uh, now i realize that each area is so broad <laughs> that uh, you know this this deep ecology ecosystem even a separate uh, uh, this can be produced on that <laughs> that is that well uh, have you had that book by julian wolfries and others introducing criticism at the 21st century no sir i don't have that ha huh. uh, go through that book because uh, in that uh, book uh, the theory uh, of uh, eco criticism uh, has been developed uh -huh. how uh, eco criticism uh, has come into existence has been well explained into that text so actually uh, there was a butcher mm -hmm. there was a butcher and uh, there was another person uh, who were possibly placed face to face as regards residents and this person facing that butcher's uh, you know shop was sick of uh, watching uh, uh, you know that uh, flesh hanging before him etc yeah so for the sake of that uh, he <coughs> i'm sorry grew up a tree hmm. in his yard so that he could avoid the sight of that hanging flesh so this is where the idea of uh, eco criticism uh, started coming into existence so a very good uh, essay Uh, uh, rather than a say a research paper that book contains yeah. julian wolf reason that is introducing criticism at the 21st century uh, julian wolf could you please repeat the title julian wolf reads that is the right yeah. introducing criticism at the 21st century okay okay thank you sir thank you very much <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Jamal. Sir, regarding the the question of uh, Mr. Sumina, the first ah. question, that, ah. uh, uh, is it applied? Uh, you said you have to read the text of the writer, ah. the what he has written in other books. Ah. But for me, uh, for example, Mr. Sumina, maybe he has taken one writer. Ah, yes but for me i have nine different writers ah should i read all their texts ah uh, well uh, at least you can read uh, the textbooks that are closely to, uh, related to your area of research I and mean, your cultural conflict suppose you have chosen uh, one arabic writer right yes and he has or she has written maybe 15 books on the topic of cultural conflict if all the textbooks deal with that uh, it would be better for you to go through all those texts and But as you have said uh, there are nine writers right yes at least uh, you should go for the maximum literature of all these writers I would suggest that you go for all the textbooks by all these writers because they would provide a wide canvas of understanding cultural conflict and make your research work as an enriched piece of writing a piece of research if you do that it would be better and better for you 
but uh, more, uh, yeah. not all their deaths are related to the uh, to the field of my study. Uh, that is fine, but uh, somehow we can find that there's correlation. There have been, you know, certain pages that, uh, or certain say, <laughs> paragraphs that are related to your topic. If you try to find out that, because that is what is called research. To find out what is difficult to find. Okay. And that would give you a sharpness of, uh, you know, reading, not only that, but uh, it would make you more confident while dealing with the area of uh, research that you have chosen for yourself. Hmm. Welcome. I think uh, I have got, uh, yes, not think, but I have got that question from Miss Anjali Wagner. How can we avoid grammar mistakes or confusing sentences in the flow of writing? It happens sometimes. Well, madam, uh, if it is a rough draft, don't bother about uh, these mistakes. Go on writing. Once you are finished with the first complete draft of your writing, then you can start working upon the grammatical mistakes and the sentences that are ambiguous. First of all, go on writing. Produce a complete draft of your work and then when it comes to reading it for the for, you know second for a second time, for a third time, you can work upon uh, you know that draft with a special focus on these areas like uh, grammatical mistakes and ambiguous sentences it would uh, definitely help you a lot and it would uh, help you overcome this barrier is it clear i hope uh, it is and that is the way i can answer your question uh, there is uh, okay that's a compliment by Mr. Vinod Kipper. Thank you very much, Vinod Kipper, for this compliment. Uh, hello, sir. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, suppose I am uh, reading a text and uh, uh, I have. Uh, how many books I have to refer for a review of that text? For example, uh, the text written by Dr. Baba Sambedkar, one text uh, that is a uh, problem of rupees. So uh, there, there are ample uh, books uh, written by various uh, critics on uh, the book. So how many uh, texts I should read for that one book? Uh, see, first of all, look for the significant or authentic material that is based upon the problem of the rupee. Okay. You need not uh, go for only, uh, you know, finding or collecting a lot of material on that. Two or three books of uh, authenticity can be sufficient okay, with respect to that otherwise finding material you can go on and on and there cannot be a limit hmm. so better you get focused upon the uh, primary material and if you find two or three more books that is go into uh, go into the sufficient I feel okay, okay. yes sir thank you sir thank you Who else? Uh, sir, uh, there are some you know, apps, say for uh, example, uh, Grammarly apps, Grammarly. So, is it, uh, you know, that uh, much uh, authentic app? Grammarly by Google, I suppose. Yeah, yes, sir, right. 
I'm sorry. Is it right to news that? And uh, I mean, uh, does it correct our grammar hundred percent correctly? Mm -hmm. Uh, that Grammarly app is produced by the Americans. Okay. If you're using American English, mm -hmm. then you can go for that. Okay. But if you wish to use uh, British English, huh. then that app cannot be that helpful to you. That app mostly uses uh, the definite article largely. I mean, oh. Mostly it uses uh, the article, that is definite article. Mm -hmm. In most of the, uh, you know, yes, that is what I mean. In British English, there are certain words that go with zero article. Okay. Okay. Huh. So, uh, on the grounds of articles, you can find this difference. Hmm. Then you also have the difference of grammar between American English and British. See, American English uses have to refer to a sentence that is uh, related to the past. Okay. In American English, for example, a sentence like I have uh, watched a film yesterday mm -hmm. can be acceptable. But in British, it is not. Second example of grammar is the Americans make use of uh, uh, than after different, whereas the British use it as different from. For example, uh, this pen is different from that is British. This mm -hmm. pen is different than that is American. Okay. There are also other, uh, you know, issues of gram like uh, the use of one o n e hmm. i was to also speak about uh, uh, degenderization in language i shall comment upon it after i answer your question <coughs> i'm sorry so in american english if one is used for example if one is interested one can enter this is a british construct in American English, it is otherwise. If one is interested, he can enter. That means one is replaced with uh, that third person singular pronoun. That is he. So this is again the change of grammar. Not only that, it also attracts criticism from uh, certain feminists. So you have to decide uh, which register you are going for, number one. If you are going for American register, that app can be helpful for you. Okay. But if you are using British English, then it cannot be that helpful. Okay? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much. Is there any uh, app that is uh, we can use for uh, British English? Uh, I am not uh, that aware, but then there is an app called BBC Spoken English. Okay. I don't know if it is spoken or simply it is BBC English. I think it is BBC English. Mm -hmm. That is an app available that can help you. Okay. Thank you. Thank but more importantly, you can go for the books like uh, Longman Book of Common Errors. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also uh, go for, uh, uh, say for example, a dictionary of uh, modern usage by Fowler. This is a very uh, well-known and reputed dictionary on uh, the usage. So these can help you a lot. Apart from this, I have already mentioned it, uh, a book like, uh, you know, in my previous talks, mm -hmm. a book like uh, Michael Swan's uh, Basic English Uses, Practical English Usage. These books can be helpful to you. I think he has got this thing too. Uh, yes, my next, uh, the next question is, uh, uh, by Mr. Amol Zadow. Sir, I remember you had said it before in previous sessions, 
the first chapter should be written at the end of all other chapters. So do we have the liberty to revise the first chapter at the time of writing conclusion of fifth chapter? See, I would uh, put two things here, uh, Amol. The first one is, even if I said that uh, the first chapter should be written at the end, uh, this is not a necessity. If you feel you should begin with the first chapter, as I mentioned today, you can go for that. And second thing is, yes, you can revise any chapter at any time until it is submitted to your supervisor. So these are the two things I can uh, put as my response to your question. Uh, next is uh, uh, Mr. Baldev. Okay, uh, he is uh, putting his compliment here. Thank you very much, Mr. Baldev Chavan. <laughs> yes, uh, Mr. Yes, uh, I think it is yes, Parmeshwar Zatlu. He has also thanked me. Uh, that is my pleasure, Mr. Parmeshwar Zatlu, uh, to be here in association with you all. Any other questions? Okay, I would like to uh, finally make a point. Whenever you use your language to draft your thesis, make sure that you maintain gender sensitivity. Mostly you degenderize your language. Major focus or the, uh, you know, major focus upon traditional pronoun or masculinity uh, can uh, weaken the tempo of your thesis. So always make sure that your language is inclusive on the basis of gender. That is male, female, transgender, etc. So make use of such pronouns that would be including almost every kind of person. And make sure that you do not produce any statements that can prove hurtful for uh, some kind of gender or some kind of sex that is female or male etc language has to be degenderized to the maximum so make sure and uh, try to avoid uh, the male dominated language so uh, that is what actually I forgot to mention uh, maintain it throughout your thesis so that you can make it a respectable linguistic presentation. That is what I wanted to uh, tell you. So, Amol Zago has also put in compliments. Thank you very much, Mr. Amol Zago, for kind words. Any other questions? Hello, sir. Hi, yes, Swamina. Uh, uh, as you said that uh, we should read all the body of literature of that particular author. Uh, so, should we include uh, uh, the uh, rest, uh, the themes of the rest of the book related to our topic in our first chapter in, in review of the uh, Not necessary, but if you come to feel that uh, they can be or they should be included, choice is yours. Narvale, sir. I think Narvale, sir, has... Uh, Narvale, sir, has been left. <laughs> he always has the problem of connectivity, but I think he's there. Uh, I think he joined now, sir. Sir, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You 
there is one more question by miss wagmare instead of i which word we can use uh, madam uh, we can uh, use madam. one in most of the places one for example uh, uh, if it is research work then you can use the word the researcher not i and to avoid other personal pronouns along with i one is the best option for example uh, there's a saying called practice makes man perfect so rather than man i mean this is a noun instead of this noun we can use one as its replacement a pronoun one practice makes one perfect and uh, uh, here there's a saying called every dog has his day so instead of his we can make use of its like this i mean th these are not the exact examples but then the example of uh, practice makes man perfect uh, is fine and the rest of the examples can be uh, drawn on a similar graph or tested on a similar graph yes uh, i think uh, sarjara sir has some issue with the internet connectivity okay he so has now, muted himself yeah. yes hi uh, yes. sir ha yes. now uh, sorry for okay. actually uh, 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 just uh, connectivity uh, hello Just yes, a sir. second, sir. Jirao, I think Somina wants to say something. Yes, no, Mr. 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 Uh -huh. No, sir, no, no. Yes, uh, Sundar, sir. Sundar, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Ah, yes, sir. I think you have put on your mobile phone on speaker mode, so uh, it is echoing all the participants. Hmm, sir, Jirao. Ah, sir. Hello. Am Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, sir, there was a technical problem, sir. Uh, that's the reason. Many time uh, it was disconnected. Uh, so, uh, hello. Yes, sir. go on, sir. Uh, may I request to Somina Mitkari, sir, to say something or uh, for his remarks? Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, good evening, one and all. On behalf of this group, uh, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Honorable Sir Dr. Mary Pandit for this enlightening and very insightful session on developing the thesis step by step. Each, uh, you know, uh, every research scholar begins his or her research work with the intention and resolution. of completing his or her research work uh, in the stipulated time but no sooner does he start his work to the apple the task looks mountainous and complex with results to persist and delay the work some time of course uh, we need to have positive attitude and perseverance to reach to the goal however we require uh, motivation and strong guidance to bring clarity to our work and to inject uh, energy and enthusiasm to meet the deadline with perfection i as a participant of this group feel very much privileged and honored to receive guidance of respected professor dr milin pandit sir i think this is the fourth week of this web talk series and every week he is enriching us with his enlightening presentation that unfolds the dimensions of research process which is profound knowledge it is always a pleasant and wonderful learning set in to listen to you sir this is not exaggeration but let me admit it here i have become your fan since i attended your lecture for the first time in pre phd course work conducted at department of english of dr baba saheb ambedkar maratra university last year your intention of listening to perfection your style of delivering the content and your way of disseminating your profound knowledge with such a clarity 
and in simple ways new imprints on our mind clearing every doubt sir you how we can really a guiding force for us all participants here who are traveling on the same boat of research work today too you have touched upon every aspect of developing the physical case step by step i'm sure everyone has got clear cut idea now about how to develop their research work today in the initial phase of your talk you explained why it is of paramount importance to read all literature written by the author that we have chosen for our research also you explained what is considered as secondary data and how should we read both primary and secondary data objectively for the purpose of research work you made a survey to keep on making notes systematically specifically handwritten notes during the process of reading to avoid becoming the victim of as you said a furia you also emphasize the significance of referring standard dictionary why and how to maintain consistency of aspect while drafting the research uh, you have cleared our doubts about where to start by hinting us to choose the chapter of our interest for sound beginning of drafting you focus your talk on how should be the sequence of cases the significance and process of drafting the rational of the of the cases the significance of topics uh, aims and objectives how to how to write them and how to write the hypothesis besides you highlighted your talk on process of writing review of literature in specific you emphasize on the view that research work should be open ended the next important dimension that you explain is difference between qualitative and quantitative data and methods for research work in the area of language teaching and linguistics you guided us on how to prepare the first draft following coherence and consistency and a process to be followed like proofreading and evaluation by supervisor there of her for finalizing it uh, finally you guided us on how to draw the conclusion and prepare final chapter no doubt sir it was an eye opening session a kind of academic quiz for all of us thank you very much for sir for the generosity of helping us in our dream project we will always be indebted to you for your initiative of uh, awareing us clearing our doubts about various dimensions of research process thank you very much sir thank you very much organizers for giving me this opportunity to put my opinion on this thing. thank you professor kirdeep sir over to you professor narod sir thank you thank you very much tamo uh, sorry so tinhat for so nice words uh thank you sir <laughs> again uh, i would say uh, i doubt if i'm worthy of that anyway thank yes, you sir you are you are <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Sir, 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 go on. Sir, yes. Sir, yes. <laughs> He has got disconnected, you know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, okay, sir. Now you know. I... Should we wait for him or should we proceed ahead? <laughs> you decide. You are the organizer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so I think uh, again, uh, thank you very much sir, for this uh, wonderful session, eye-opening session, and really, uh, I feel privileged uh, to be your student uh, for the PhD. I personally learning a lot from you uh, in my research work and in my personal life too. For that, uh, I'm really grateful to you. Thank you very much, sir. And I again thank you very much all the participants who are uh, joining here for the session. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, with this word, uh, I take your leave. One, uh, I'm sorry, last uh, time also I have forgotten that. Uh, I really thank you to the. Uh, Mr. Baldev Chavan sir, for his technical support, uh, the pain, uh, the effort he 
two uh, for this uh, session and every session. So uh, I would like to mention him partic uh, particularly for this for his uh, technical support. Thank you so much. And with this word, uh, I take your leave and uh, with the permission of the sir, I would like to end the meeting. Thank you so much, okay. one and all. Yes, uh, Baldev is the backbone of this program. I mean, as far as technical arrangement is concerned. <laughs> well yes, said, sir. you know. Yes. yes and I'm, uh, I'm equally proud of all my, uh, you know, friends that are registered with me as uh, research candidates. And I'm really happy that uh, every other member that is uh, uh, with us every time has uh, his and her presence uh, quite encouraging to us. So thank you one and all again. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I end the meeting with your permission. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir.